Okay, we're gonna shift gears, and we're gonna have, so we're gonna start, stop there on part four in the business plan, and we're gonna have a conversation with a gentleman who I would recognize as someone who has absolutely taken a lot of what we've taught over the last few years and implemented it right away. And here's what I love when we pay attention to success stories in the industry. I wanna know who's using our stuff at a high level and what is their trajectory? Because as I mentioned to you, I, I wanna put people in front of you that are implementing at a fast pace and accepting things with blind faith. And so our next conversation is uh, with a gentleman that is absolutely not only committed to his goal, but committed to doing better. And we're gonna get to hear from him over the next 20, 25 minutes or so. And what I want you to do is I want you to turn to a clean sheet of paper. Turn to a clean sheet of paper. And I want you to write down at the top, so yeah, skip, flip through your business plan. And I want you to write down at the top, one-on-one -on -one interview, Andy Nelson. One-on-one -on -one interview, Andy Nelson. Now I know they're gonna bring up another chair, if you wanna bring that up now. One-on-one -on -one interview, Andy Nelson. And I want you to pay attention to the things that are being implemented at a high level and just look for takeaways when you're thinking of your second half business plan. Part four and part five are all about new sales strategies and new sources of business. So I want you to give some sincere thought to this source of business that we're going to talk about because it is a proven one and it's not just proven in the last market, it's proven in this market. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Andy Nelson to the stage. Andy, come on out. Come on, get it. Thank you, brother. All right, you ready? Yeah. Grab a seat. Do you want to do the Kathy thing and stand the whole time? <laughs> no, we no. can sit. Okay. No. Okay. That was fun. That was fun. <laughs> so Andy, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, man. So this is year 12 in the business. Well, in and out. Um, originally licensed in 2011 while active duty Navy. Mm -hmm. Left the Navy. Thank you for your service. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I left the Navy in 2012 with the idea of, of going full time into real estate and did so. Um, Hold on one second. Can you guys set the timer for uh, 45 18 minutes? minutes. Oh, 18 sorry. Minutes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it didn't last long. Um, had a great first year, went through life, um, went through a breakup, the whole, you know, we've all been there, right? We, we've experienced hardships. And at the time, the best thing for me was to quit real estate. Yeah. So I did, um, got out of real estate. And I'm in Virginia Beach, by the way, um, big military town. And, uh, yep, there we go. <laughs> There's Kaleo. He brought his family. <laughs> um, so I, I actually moved back home to North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was about four hours away where I grew up and was completely out of real estate. And then, let's see, 2015, took a job as a sales and marketing director for a Keller Williams team in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. That was a contract position, it lasted a year, and I decided I wanted to get back into sales. Okay. So uh, I called my friend, Mike Little, best friend, known him for, actually I've known his daughter longer than he has. He was deployed when she was born. That's, that's how the military lifestyle works. Yeah, I bet. Um, but he's here today as well. And uh, I called Mike and I was like, hey man, I wanna get back into business. He said, I got a room for you. Okay. I moved back to Virginia. It lasted about four and a half months. Mm -hmm. And uh, being away from my then girlfriend, my now wife, being apart, the distance, we just couldn't handle it. Um, so I moved back to North Carolina. Yep. And then finally COVID happened. And, and I know for most people it was... Um, so you gave up on real estate for a second time. Gave up on real estate for a second time. Which, you know, there's people in this room that have those thoughts at some point in time. Absolutely. Or have had those thoughts at some point in time. And of course, they're all here. So they got through it just like you did. But. Right, right. Um, You're not alone, essentially, is what I'm saying. Right. Um, and there's, there's, kind of, there's going to be a, a theme of this for me. Jeff doesn't know this, but um, relationships. Relationships kind of stems from the who that Justin talked about yesterday. And I'll highlight a few of those people along the way because I think I'm not here without them, right? Yeah. So um, got married in 2018 after I had quit real estate a second time. Yep. Um, went to work in corporate America, finished my degrees. I figured, you know, this is it for me. I'm going to be a marketing manager. I have, I have a master's in marketing. And um, then COVID happened and the world shut down. Yep. And the company that I worked for sent us to work from home. During that time, my good friend Mike 
decided for some reason to open a brokerage um, in the middle of COVID. May of 2020, they opened um, and decided they were gonna do their grand opening party at the end of July. I drove the four hours just to go support my friend in Virginia Beach. You weren't thinking anything about getting back. No, home. just wanted to go support my friend. Yep. Um, drove back home that night and told my wife I was getting into real estate again. And she said, okay. <laughs> for a third um, time. For a third time. And that was, so that was September, I'm sorry, um, July 25th was uh, the grand opening party. Yep. No real estate license. I had to take the exam again, had to go through the entire process again. Yep. September 11th activated my license and moved back into Mike's house yep. <laughs> uh, Labor Day weekend. So just 45 days later, you know, it was time. I took a leap of faith and, and ran with it. And how long did you live with them before you got your own place? What was it, Mike? Two years. Yes, Two years, yeah. 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 Yeah, well, so it's funny. I lived there the entire time he lived there because I helped him move in and I helped him move out two years later when he sold it. So there you go. Yep. So um, you, would, you might still be living in his house today if he had hadn't moved. Well, so long story short, it took two years because in real estate, in order to buy a house, you've got to have that proof of income and, and your yeah. tax returns. Yep. So I lived for two years in Mike's spare bedroom four hours away from my family Yeah. Um, to a point of like, my wife would have to come see me because in 21 and 22, you guys know how the market was. Yeah. Um, I couldn't take weekends off to go home. No. My wife would come visit me and then jump in the car and ride along for showings. Yeah. Um, and then finally, last year in yeah, July. She, nobody, what else was she going to do? Right, right. And then finally, last year in July, we sold our house in North Carolina, bought a new house in Virginia, moved the family up, and, and we're coming up on a year back you know, as a family. And that was last July? Last July, right. Wow. And today, you, you own the brokerage with Mike? You are partners in it? I am a partner. Yep. We have, um, there's five of us partners in total. Mike was one of the original founders and we talked about it in coffee with coaches this morning. I showed up, I poured into people, I, I presented opportunity and I, and I worked hard. Yeah. Um, and then there was an opportunity within the brokerage that Mike extended to me, yeah. um, you know, based not only on our friendship, but also the amount of work that was, that was being put in. So we've got five of us owners now. We have five locations. I was just saying, you're, you're a leader of one of the locations. Correct, correct. Which location? Um, I'm our second location. So um, the first location was in Virginia Beach. Um, that office right now holds about 100 agents. Yep. My office was second. I'm in Chesapeake, just the next city over. Sure. I've got about 50 agents there. And then we've opened three offices this year. So you're leading a brokerage and you're in production. Correct, yeah. correct. So how do you balance your time between the two? Um, <laughs> Well, you've got a time block. Yeah. You absolutely have to time block. Yeah. You, can't do, you can't do what we do without, without a time block. So being ridiculously disciplined with your time, which I'm sure the military helped with that. Absolutely. Also, and this is the same thing I tell leaders all the time, if you want to make your life easier as a leader in the real estate industry, just set an example for gosh sakes. Just be the example to follow. Right. Right. Your training is built in if you're the example, right? Absolutely. Now, your prospecting may look a little different because you might be prospecting for agents versus prospecting for buyers and sellers. And I know in your case, you're doing both. Right. So talk to us a little bit about your business. Uh, last year you closed 69 units. 69 units. And this year you're on pace for 80. 80, 84. Okay. 84 is the goal. My idea is seven a month. Got it. Um, I set that goal before we decided to add 100 agents and open three offices. Yep. Um, so that's monopolized a little bit of the time, but 80, 84 is the target. So you're managing a brokerage. Managing a brokerage. And you're producing 80 sales a year. Producing 80 84. sales a year. Correct. Okay. So how much do you work? That sounds like a lot. I work, uh, I actually, I follow the Jeff Glover schedule. Okay. The six days a week, yep. um, Monday through Saturday. So guaranteed I'm in the office from 8 a.m. to noon, Monday through, Monday through Saturday. Saturday is a normal work day. I don't work at all on Sundays. Yeah. And Saturday, you know, when I suggest people to work six days a week, I, I really call it like five and a half because right. If a normal work day for someone selling 80 to 100 houses a year, by the way, a normal work day for someone selling 80 to 100 houses a year is probably 7A to 6P, 7A to 630P, maybe someday 7A to 7P. 7.05, my alarm goes off. Okay, perfect. Yeah. So, um, which, you know, that, that gives a lot of hope to all my hashtag 5AM club, by the way. Did you guys hear that? You can start at 7AM, that's not 5AM. Right. That's right. Um, and your Saturday is not 7A to 7P though, no. right? So when, when I say I work a Saturday, I'm not working 7A to 7P you know, coming in a little bit later and getting off a little bit earlier, but it's not a full day, I would imagine. No, so I really, I really time block the Saturday morning. So I like to design, I like artwork and, and graphic design, and I do all of my own graphic design for my marketing material. You enjoy that's, it? That's Saturday morning, I, I love it. Yeah. I love it. So every other Saturday, I host a training in the brokerage. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of 
part-time agents, active duty military agents, where they can't get into the trainings during the week. Yeah. So on Saturday mornings, twice a month, we host, I host a training. It's usually SLS, yeah. something that I've learned from Glover that we're passing on. Um, you know, we then, have something in common there. A lot of people don't know this, and, and Alana, our marketing director, she would second this, and Rachel would too, because I drive them crazy. I am very meticulous, like down to the workbook, every page. Nope, move this here, make that a little bigger here. I'm very meticulous about art and the way things look. Yeah. And I think there's some, some, you know, in this industry, we are, we are in a sales and marketing industry. Yes. So that, that is a little bit of an unfair advantage you have if you understand the way things should look, right? It is, but also... Because <laughs> it's part of your presentation. Right. Well, the number one thing that I learned in the military, and you guys will probably all laugh at this, is PowerPoint. <laughs> I, my job in the military, I was a weatherman. So literally green screen, but it's a PowerPoint that I put together that I was presenting to, yeah. you know, the commander of the ship or, yep. or the pilots or whomever. What are um, they called? They're, they're called slideshows, right? Slideshows, right. What, what, what are they called now, though? Do they keep the word slides in there? Is that it's just called slides? I don't think they call it slideshow. But okay. Go on. Okay. Sorry. I'm old. Um, <laughs> but PowerPoint. So all of my design work I do in PowerPoint. So any of the things that I talk about that I do, every single person in this room can do. And I think that's really important to, to remember as we go through this. I'm not doing anything special. Yeah. I'm just doing it consistently. That's right. Yep, I love that. All right, so let's talk about your, your business for a second. You've been a one-on-one -on -one coaching client since January of last year. You've been a listing mastery graduate last year. Systems of real estate, you graduated that in 2021. Prospecting boot camp, you graduated that in 2021. Why have you taken so many courses? I've given you a lot of money. <laughs> well, I mean, so <laughs> I don't take any. Well, I, yes, um, it gets all reinvested. True story. I mean, yeah. every dollar gets re put absolutely. back in. Absolutely, absolutely, and we believe it. It shows, right? Can we can we get one of that? <laughs> so, you told me, you know, I spend a lot of time and energy with my database and specifically marketing to my database. Correct. So talk to us a little bit about that. So there's a 52 touch or 52 point touch plan with the database. Okay. So it averages out to once a week. Once a week you're doing something. Something, correct. Okay. Um, and, and, it, and it's an average, right? I mean, it's, it may not Some be. Some weeks there might be two. It's not every Wednesday, right? right. It's, it's, Got it. it's an average. Got it. um, and that consists of six client events throughout the year. Um, each one of those client events has a direct mail piece, um, an email, a text, and a phone call to invite them to that. So that's five touches per event. Um, 18 pieces of direct mail, which some of that's included in the events. So yep. 12 separate um, and 12 emails. So repeat those numbers again because they probably want to write them down. So, so write these down. So direct mail, there's 18 pieces. 18 pieces annually. Annually, correct. Okay. Um, 12 emails. 12 emails, that's once monthly? Correct. Yep. How, how did you arrive at 18? Are there some months where there's two? So um, I implemented this system when I first got back into real estate, um, and it's just a, it, it's a, a postcard. Mm -hmm. It's an every other month postcard. It's part of the post-closing process, thanks to systems. Mm -hmm. um, once, once it closes, they go into the system. Every other month for the next 24 months, they get a postcard from me. Got it. And it costs 20 bucks. Okay. So, so that's the six. That's every the month. six. Correct. What are the 12? The 12 are direct pieces of mail that I'm sending. So it's our newsletter, our invites to the events, uh, market updates, Got it. all those types Once of things. Once a month they're getting one of those in addition to those six. Correct. Got it, okay. What else with your database? That's really it. I just, I mean, I double down on it. Um, like I said, the six events, that's, that's huge. Six client events six in a year. Six client events in a year, yep. Some are bigger, some are smaller, I would imagine. Correct. Okay. Um, What's your biggest client event? What's your smallest client event? Um, the smallest client event is the car wash, mm -hmm. oddly enough. Um, it's just a postcard. I partnered with a local car wash. Show up on this day during this time and, these, and, and get your car wash for free. Yeah. It's nice because they're there for 10 minutes while they're doing the inside of the car and then they move on. Yeah. And it just kind of keeps the people moving through. Yeah. Um, the, and what does that cost you? Um, it's about 22 bucks a car. Okay. Um, so I spent this year, I had about 50 cars come through. It was around 1100 bucks. Okay, got yeah. it. And when you look at the results that you get from your database, obviously, and by the way, you know, everyone should consider doing this as part of their business plan. You can't, it, it's extremely difficult to measure. Like for instance, you probably couldn't attach a commission to that event, right? Correct. You couldn't say, if I do this car wash thing, 50 cars, $1,100, I'm gonna get $10,000 in GCI. You can't attach the number to right. that. But what you can do, which is what we do, is every year we look at how much business did we get from our database and how much did we spend? How much business did we get from our database, which means units, GCI, commissions, and how much did we spend? And then when we add things, when we make adjustments, if we decide we're gonna do the car wash, 
we look back and say, okay, here's all the things we did from our database in 2022. Here's what we spent. Now, by how much did our database business increase? This is the formula that we use. Yes. Because if I spent $8,000 more on my database in 2022 than in 2021, I need to know, did it make a difference? Yeah. So then I look back to database closed business. 2022, database closed business, we closed an additional eight transactions mm -hmm. over 2021. What's our average commission? $8,000. We spent 8,000 to make an additional 64,000. That math works out. Yep. So when you're looking at what you're doing to add value to your database, because we spend a lot of time talking about this and we will over the next couple days, I want you to calculate how your business is increasing from the database so that way you can determine if what you're doing is actually working and actually profitable. Yes. Because if you add these things and your database business stays the same, well then that actually means your profit's gonna be less and we're not in the business of losing profits. So one, one thing to add to that, I get people that come to me all the time and say, I wanna do client events. I see what you're doing, I wanna do it, what do I do? And we, I'll give them guidance, obviously, but where most people fall off is they don't track it, they don't plan accordingly. I have all of my events for, the, for all of 23 planned by like November at, yeah. at, at the end of the year. Yeah. I take that time between November or Thanksgiving and Christmas, honestly, and, and there's a plan for the entire year. Yeah. My mailer campaign, campaign is planned for the entire year. Yeah. All of my events, everything is laid out for, for the next 12 months. Yeah. And, and it's easy when it's there and when you have a plan. My assistant does all of my mailings. Yeah. I don't do that. Yeah. I'll sign you know, my name on the bottom line, but she does all of that. And that's where it becomes Pass, I send a thousand pieces of mail a month. We'll talk about hybrid farming. Yeah. Um, but my assistant does all of that. And that's where, that's where you get leverage and you get time back. And that's how I can continue to lead generate while leading a brokerage and while holding yeah. that level of production. And at 80 units a year or even 70 units a year, what's your average sales price? 320. Yeah, at those numbers, it makes sense. 100%. To add leverage, right? 100%. So um, you talked about hybrid farming. What, is that, what does that mean to you? Um, so hybrid farming is, is a turn or twist on, on the traditional farming. I know you guys probably all get postcards mailed to your house from realtors, and you might get one or two a year from that agent. Yep. Um, hybrid when farming- When they just take a listing or when it just sells. Right, right, just kind of one-offs. Yeah. Um, hybrid farming, again, goes back to having a plan where I've committed to a certain neighborhood for a certain period of time. It's direct mail, it's holding events in the neighborhood, it's being present in those neighborhoods. So instead of just the one-offs, it's right. just picking a neighborhood and going deeper into that neighborhood instead of casting a wider net and sprinkling around. Yes, Got exactly. It. Which by the way, we're covering that this afternoon. I'm gonna do some hybrid farming stuff. So I know you work with a lot of buyers. In yes, <laughs> yes. How do you manage 70 to 80 transactions and still show homes? Well, typically I don't show homes. Um, well, how that, do you, how that do you much sell the anymore? Um, the sale? Well, who, do, who shows the houses? So I've got. A, I run a showing agent model. Okay. Um, I have one. She is a rock star showing agent, mm -hmm. um, and and she makes my life much easier. Okay. Um, and the the way that works. And so you take you you pay her a portion of your commission. She gets a flat fee. Oh, she's a she's a base flat fee. or salary or something yep, like that. Yep. Got it. Um, okay. Um, so. And this is this is where it gets tricky because I'm I'm heavy database right. Yep. So I have the I have the, the person, relationship. I need the relationship. And by the way, that's what most of the audience hears when they think, how could I give a buyer away when they're working with me because of me? How right. could I let somebody else show them houses? They have the relationship with me. Right. So it's it's so pretty how do you overcome that. It's pretty simple. So I set the appointment. You know, the lead comes to me. I set the appointment. I still conduct the buyer consultation. We don't show houses without a buyer consultation. I know it's against the ALM method. And I'm sorry, <laughs> yes. I haven't adapted yet. Yep. Um, but all of my buyers come into the office. My showing agent is present. Yep. We do a buyer consultation. I conduct the buyer consultation, and then I make the connection. Yep. From there, she takes it. She sets up their search. She schedules their showings. She manages that whole side of things. I'm just kept in a group text, so I know what's going on. So they're, you're not. They don't feel like they're being passed off to an assistant. You, you, they actually, you're. you're you're helping them understand the benefit Absolutely. of having a showing agent. She's, she's outside sales, I'm inside sales. Yep. And then you've got two of us that work for you, so if she's not available, I can be available. And how do they normally respond to that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, and that's the thing. Like, one, of the, one of my biggest pet peeves with this industry is agents don't treat it like a profession. Yeah. We are licensed professionals. We have licenses that are governed by our boards, by our states. And you have to take control of your time, take control of your schedule, and don't let the clients run you. Yeah. When you set an expectation up front with the client, um, thank you. Yeah, you that. <laughs> when you set the expectation up front with a client, they respect it. 
Yeah. But if you don't have the, I don't know, the fortitude yeah. to, to set that expectation. You're training them how to treat you. Exactly, exactly. You don't call the doctor and say, hey, I need, I need to see you tomorrow. Yep. You know, there's a process for that. You don't call the dentist and say, I, I, I want to come in tomorrow. No, that's not how it works. Yeah. And the challenge with uh, technology, that, that has made that pressure even greater on us as agents. Mm -hmm. Because if you don't respond that way, all they have to do is click a button on Zillow and somebody will say yes to that appointment and they'll right. make them over. Right, I don't, I don't work Sundays. Yeah. And I set that expectation up front. Yeah. I had a conversation with, um, with an attendee earlier. She's worried about her time running over and, and you know, missing time with her kids and having issues at home. You've got to set a stop time. Yep. And that's a, that's a Kate Simon thing, wherever you are. Start time um, and Start time and a stop time every yep. day. Yeah. So um, last thing I wanted to ask you about, I know um, you manage your CRM at a pretty high level. So how do you get results from your CRM when, when everyone else is just kind of still trying to figure it out? So I know this feels like a, a cop-out answer, but it's the three by three, yeah. three by three by three by three. Um, and Which it's, is what? And Not it's everyone time block. It. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, so within the first three days, you were doing a call, text, and email all three days. So all three, all three days with a new lead. Three calls, three texts, three emails. All within three days of the lead coming All in. within three days of the lead coming in. And what would you say to the person that says, well, Andy, that's kind of a lot. Like, that's aggressive. Aren't I going to piss them off? I mean, well, come on. That's a lot. I have a job to do. Yeah. And, and my they job. They never get mad, do they? My job is to help you. Yeah. I mean, they never get mad. Well, and especially, like, we, we're in a military town. There's a lot of first-time home buyers. There's a lot of people who go to work on a ship every day where they can't take their cell phones. Yeah. So I have the three by three by three time blocked different periods on different days of the week. Yeah. So it's time blocked just to make sure that we get it done. Yeah. And guess what? I only get one or two leads a day. Yeah. You know, I'm not, I'm not overwhelming myself sure. with 60 or 70 leads that I have to follow up with. I knew initially that, you know, I use Sync. Yep. And when I first signed up with Sync, I was paying for buyer leads that I was wasting because I couldn't, also. I couldn't follow up with Sync. It was just too many leads. Yeah. So I switched to seller leads. And now with the seller leads, the quantity has come down, but I can manage it. Yeah. So I don't need a ton of leads to be able to manage my CRM effectively. Yeah. It's better for me with less leads. Yeah. Um, one of the things that people get concerned about with the three by three by three by three is that it's going to be too aggressive or too, too strong or too much in their face. And what we have to remember is they're not keeping track. They're not keeping score. No, no. They don't know all of the times you reached out to them. In fact, there's probably a lot of times where it's your fifth or sixth attempt and they act as if it's the first time they're hearing from you. 100%. Because only you are making notes of when you attempted. Yes. They aren't. Correct. They get so many notifications today, so many calls, so many text messages, so many emails, social media notifications buzzing all the time. They can't keep up with all the people reaching out to them, so they don't know all of these reach outs. So that's why it's actually an effective method, because the most recent study done, as you know, yep. says the average internet lead today will respond not after your first, not after your second, not after your third, not after your fourth, but after your fifth attempt. And that study was done about three years ago, a pretty vast study. Right. I would argue it's probably five and a half or six today because we're inundated with even more stuff today. So the three by three by three is, is your secret sauce to yes. converting your CRM leads. Yes. Got it. Yeah. So one thing I think is, is pretty cool, um, you know, when we have events like this and when we have people that are in our programs, we're always paying attention to who's professional, who, who fits our core values, who's gritty, who's, who's trajecting, uh, who do we want to be around, who do we want to learn from? And um, we have since tapped Andy on the shoulder and said, hey, would you join us on our coaching team? Yeah. And what was your answer? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so we'll finish with this. Why did you decide to take us up on that offer? So. Glover was, was the who. And I know I talked earlier about having relationships and finding your who. Since 2007, Mike Little has been a who in my life. Yeah, um, thanks Mike. <laughs> yeah, um, since, since 2015, my wife has been a who in my life. And, and since two years ago, I sat in this room and told myself that I wanted to be on this stage. Yeah. So since 2021, Glover U has been a who in my life. Yeah, yep. thank you for that. Absolutely. And we're proud to have you with us. I know there's probably several people out here that would love to coach with you. If you're interested in working with Andy, go see the booth. I know you've got a limited schedule because he's also in production, which I love. I mean, right. You're on the ground, you're in it. And so uh, I know you're not gonna be able to say yes to everybody, but uh, they can ask at the booth and, and get more sure, information sure. if they wanna work with you. Absolutely. Sounds good. Let's hear it for Andy. Thank you, sir. Thanks, Mike. Thank you, David.